Uh, Mitch, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, so we do have a little bit of history. You're a Geelong boy. Yeah. Making it in the big smoke um, on Channel 7 and AFL.com. Um, how are things going? Going really well, thanks. It's been a big year. It's uh, crazy to think we're at finals already. And it just is like a blur from when you, you start the season to think that the the 23 weeks come and then finals are here. I just was in Perth on the weekend and absolutely elite. But you go, go, go all the time. So uh, looking forward to the end of the season. Trade period will come around pretty quick as well. Mm. And then uh, we get a bit of a breather. That's when you start to do your best work in trade period. I feel love seeing Mitchy Cleary's name pop up. <laughs> and you just know that you're getting some real news. This is actually happening. But uh, before you got into the journalism, you must have been a bit of a footy nuffy. Oh, uh, yeah. Were you a bit of a failed footballer and then <laughs> used journalism as your way into the industry? Absolutely. I reckon you've done a bit of research. On this. <laughs> uh, nah, I was uh, absolutely footy nuffy. I think I was a Geelong member from the age of six. Still yeah. am a, a Cats member, but uh, the family used the tickets most of the time. Played footy right up until I was sort of 18, 19 at uh, St. Mary's in Geelong and then sort of realised when I was 14, 15 I was never going to make it <laughs> and just loved reading the papers, like watching all the TV shows and just absorbing everything media. So uh, it probably just fell that way that I was lucky enough to, to have a bit of a passion and, and follow my, uh, my path that way. What sort of footballer were you down at St. Mary's? Because you may not know this, but you were not the only bit of St. Mary's alumni in the room. Caden, you are also a St. St. Mary's sort of former, well, former superstar. Yeah, talking trade news, I went from Torquay <laughs> under 16 Bs to St. Mary's under 18 Bs. Uh, the St. Mary's under 18 team that I played for, and probably the same as you, very, very strong. They won flags like back to back to back when I was there. Well, I was uh, actually bit of uh, self-indulgence for, for yeah, a moment. Yeah, go for it. Premiership captain for the first of, oh, of, oh. of eight, uh, under our under 18 flags, and we won the next six. So wow. uh, I can lay claim to uh, setting up the dynasty. I didn't realise we are in the presence of royalty. <laughs> that is incredible. That is incredible. Um, I might have to have a look when I go down to the uh, the club rooms again, try and see some of the photos. Some that of the is incredible, Mitch. Um, let's, let's scrap every question we had about the journalism. <laughs> I want to know more about the budding football career and how you didn't make it in league footy. <laughs> so, so you were doing a lot of great stuff on um, AFL.com and you've recently moved to Channel 7. So how's that big change been for you? It's crazy because every day you're sort of on air and you every night you're producing mm. content for the news. So it's sort of go from AFL.com.au where you might have some super crazy days and you know some days where you get the chance to make a few more calls, catch up with people for coffees, but... Every night you're on, so um, you've got to produce something uh, f- for the Bulletin each night. And, um, yeah, it's just intense. You, you, so much goes into it. Like having worked in TV for, for 12 months now, you get a, such a great appreciation for the camos and the work they do, mm. all the producers, all the um, graphic staff, everyone that is working behind the scenes that goes into a one-hour news Bulletin and uh, making it what it is. Yeah, we and we do love all those guys, but not as much as we love Mitch Cleary. <laughs> <laughs> how, uh, how did you find yourself getting into journalism? When did that passion and desire sort of explode for you? Well, I was 16 going to St. Joey's uh, College in Geelong and absolutely loved it. Thought, this is what I want to do. And there was a Hot Shots program that popped up at the Geelong Addy. It was like an eight-week workshop course. It was like a one-hour session for eight weeks after school and uh, was part of that with a few other you know, year 11, 12 uni students and that sort of thing. And I was in year 10 at the time and then just continued to pester and pester. Got some shifts covering the GFL, like the local Geelong Free yeah. League. Did my first game when I was 15, covering Devin Smith's debut for Lara in the GFL. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that day he kicked four goals on debut. And we always have a bit of a chuckle when we bump into each other. <laughs> and Peter Riccardi, the Geelong great, was coaching the opposition. So Father of Jake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think his son's actually a chance to go father son this year for the yeah, case. He's the yeah. other kid. Um, <laughs> and from there, just sort of kept working with the John Addy, um, trying to, you know, build up resume and, and trying to, um, you know, learn on the day. Because every, like, people come up to you for advice and it's like mm. every interview you do, you guys, you know, would know, like every interview you do, you'll take something out of it, no matter how old you are and what level of experience it is. And then uh, from there, uh, year 11, 12, and then just sort of got an internship with uh, Croc Media, working with Craig Hutchison yeah. and, and Damien Barrett and um, had to uh, move up the highway. So so that was when um, I first heard of Mitch Cleary was when we heard that there was like someone from Geelong who was working on Footy Classified and maybe the Sunday Footy Show and whatnot. Um, and it seemed like you were pretty like directly below Damien Barrett or he sort of took you under his wing. So what was those first few years at Croc Media like? like yeah it was awesome it was croc media yeah i don't know now it's probably got 150 200 employees in melbourne alone but at mm. the time it probably had about 15 20 so it was a really up and coming business and uh they were trying to put a bit more emphasis on the news space so damien took me under his wing still really close with him and he's been a mentor of mine um 
working my way through the industry. But um, at the start, like I was 19, um, going door stops for Footy Classified, Footy Show. This is when Damo had his Footy Show segment. And yeah. still remember sitting there with him like 20 minutes before some Footy Shows, working out what he's about to say on air, like live on TV at the time. And I was like 19, 20. I'm like, why are you wow. coming to me for advice? Like we're, we're sort of working through this together. Um, but the footy show was humming at that stage and it was pretty cool to be part of it, albeit like a, a pretty small part. I was mainly, mostly just working with Damo. Didn't have much to do with Sammy and uh, JB and Gaz. But, Roger uh, was a small part of the footy show as well. Yeah, right? yeah. I was about to say, I'm, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Purple Barrett when um, I was a little tucker on the footy show, made a few appearances on the panel and um, he was so so kind to me backstage as well. But I, I'm curious to know about um, how you go from sort of a relative unknown to building up enough relationships and networking to the point where you can be a news breaker. How do you build those relationships so then people trust you with their information? Yeah, it's so funny. Like when I just talking about the demo stuff, I was 19, 20, trying to make calls for him to help him for his segment mm. and you were getting people going back what do I want to speak to you because you're not the one that's going to be presenting the news Damo is the one that's mm. actually going to be breaking this news yeah but I found that when you sort of at that age you're trying to speak to people on the, the same sort of level if that makes sense like the guy not the not the CEO at the footy club you might be trying to make a relationship with like an assistant coach or someone in the footy department that's like working around the traps and you're sort of trying to get in touch with people at the, at the lower level. And then when you sort of mm. start to get a bit more prominence that they're a bit more prominent themselves. So player managers, recruiters, assistant coaches, footy department staff at mm. clubs, um, there's always different sources, but you can't just start ringing Gil McLaughlin when you're yeah, yeah. you know, so it's funny how it works out. With people trying to get into journalism, I think that's probably the lesson. Like you just took a foot in the door opportunity and went from there. Yeah, it was incredibly lucky the way it aligned. And I always say like with Geelong, it's a big enough town that there's enough good footy. Like I did a bit of Geelong cat stuff when I was young and mm. the, Je the Geelong footy league's pretty good league, but it's also small enough that a 16, 17 year old kid can get opportunities like that. So I was incredibly fortunate that it, it panned out the way it did, but um, yeah, it's uh, still a long way to go until uh, we're, uh, we're, we're cracking those big stories every day. How do you decipher what sort of story you go with or, or what is true and what isn't true? I, I know like, on your Twitter, your DMs are open. So how much, like, good stuff do you get through, like, people DMing you on Twitter? <laughs> how many screenshots of WhatsApp group chats do you have to <laughs> sift through before you get the real ones? Yeah, you get a few uh, of those. <laughs> but you do get a couple of nuggets. I still remember this, like, Sam Mitchell, it was the night before he got traded to West Coast. Someone messaged me saying, <laughs> Sam Mitchell is going to get traded to West Coast. What? And this was like unheard of at the time. Yeah. No one would even think that a premiership great at Hawthorne. And I reckon that might have been almost the one that started a bit of this evolution of players just being up, being able to up and go and move to a new club. Yeah. And I still remember thinking, oh, that's, you know, just another rumour, bit of gossip, whatever. Didn't check it out. The next day confirmed Sam Mitchell goes to West Coast. Unreal. Still kicking yourself over not checking it out. The ones you don't check out, the ones you hear about and don't, you know what I mean? Like, so what would be your process then? So say now someone messages, yeah, Sam Mitchell's going to West Coast, yeah. right? Probably wouldn't happen anymore considering he's been retired for about five years. <laughs> you never but, know. But, but if it did, what's your next step? Are you ringing Sam Mitchell's player manager? You, what calls are you making to, to verify this story and make sure it's true? Yeah, both clubs. You're ringing the Hawks. You're ringing the Eagles at that time. You're ringing um, his player management group, people around him. You might be ringing you know, people that know him or um, might be around the mark. Um, people... Other clubs, like other recruiters at other clubs, often get a little bit of a, a hint when, when things are going down. With the Sam Mitchell one, not, not so much, but, you know, the, the Tim Taranto one, for example, mm. it's probably Collingwood and Richmond are looking, looking more like Richmond, but then Collingwood might get a, an indication because they're told, uh, hey, we're out of the race. So yeah. there's always multiple parties to, to different stuff. But from that point, going back to the DMs, anytime <laughs> anyone messages stuff, even if it's quirky, I know I'll probably get people DMing yeah, and down yeah. Yeah. Random, <laughs> random stuff, but... You do try and check them out as best you can because you never know what's real or not.